Yesterday was Christmas, which means we have officially entered the Christmas season, at least liturgically anyway. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm worn out and I need a couple of days off, so if I don't answer any of the phone calls tomorrow or Tuesday, understand that I'm just taking a break and leave a message and I'll call you back on Wednesday. And I've heard that in the past, you may have been told this Sunday was referred to as Low Sunday, but I've never been one to adhere to that label. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand people having guests or are traveling to see family. I get it. We have the same issue. I mean, I've been preaching about come home for Christmas for months. I get it, and I understand. But this week is a life goes on week. It's a come down the mountain week. It's a the holidays over, now what week? And that's why being here today is important. Tomorrow we leave all the family laughter, joy, and celebrations, and we go back into the world where we have to deal with the absence as much as the presence, where we have to face uncertainty that lies alongside our hope where we have to deal with the disappointment of knowing that it'll be another year before these gatherings happen again. 364 more days until Christmas. Well, today is also important because it gives us a place to ease our way back into the brokenness of the world around us. A place where we can be real about what we face day by day in this life, but we do it from the confidence that we're surrounded by home by a community that truly loves and cares for us. You see, the church is the visible sign that we are not alone in this world, no matter how difficult it might be at any one time. And you know, this disappointment of leaving family, of celebrations ending, of going back to the normal after gathering, well, this is nothing new. It's been happening since Jesus' time. In fact, the Bible even has a story about Mary and Joseph dealing with a time such as this. So let's get our Bibles and let's read about it. I'm going to ask you to open to the book of Luke. And we're going to look at chapter 2 and we're going to focus on verses 41 to 52. And it's on page 716 in the Pew Bibles, or at least I think it is. But we're looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52 page 716 in the Pew Bible, and we're going to read it responsively as normal. I'll read the first verse, you read the next one, and we're going to go through these verses until we get to the end. So it's chapter 2 in the book of Luke, starting with verse 41. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. Read verse 42. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Verse 44. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. Verse 46. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Verse 48. When his parents saw him, they were silent. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Verse 50. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. Verse 52. Let us pray. God, as we grow, help us grow in wisdom as well. Help us to know you better so that we can show and teach others about your amazing love. Holy Spirit, be with and among us today. Guide us in our learning and understanding. Lord, lead us 
to where we need to be. Amen. So Christmas Day has come and gone again. Lots of activity, lots of stress, both good and bad. Lots of preparation and planning, lots of schedules and events. It was good. Grand and glorious. The most wonderful time of the year, according to some. Difficult for others who deal with loss and change in a season of tradition. A season of excess, which can be good or bad, as you well know. But now it's gone. The calendar page pulled off to reveal another day and another. And boy, those days just keep marching on. And you might not realize it, but we're in the assessment phase now. I don't know if you noticed that when you saw people this morning Did you have a good Christmas? How was your Christmas? Did you have a good Christmas? That's the assessment phase. And I know for the most part that it's just polite conversation uh, uh, intended to get on to the next item on the list, but I tend to overanalyze things, so I sometimes pause before answering those questions. Did you have a good Christmas? Hmm. Let me think. In what terms? Uh, Presents given and received? Check. Food desired and prepared and eaten? (laughs) Check. Enough time spent with family? There can always be more. But we got the whole day, so check. The right combination of sleeplessness and naps? Mm, There's never enough naps, so that one I'm not going to give a check to. I guess I did have a good Christmas. And a good Advent season, too. The preparation for the coming and the Eve celebrations as well, they were good. It was wonderful seeing so many people in the church the other night. It was good. Busy, exhaustive, creative, challenging, and good. I had a good one. All around, it was good. So, Why the hesitation? Why do I pause when asked this question? Why do I have to consider before responding when these questions are asked? Well, like I said, I overanalyze. I think too much sometimes. Not enough others, but sometimes I think too much. And I think about what it was all about. The call of Advent to watch and wait, to long for a Savior, to long for completion, the glory of Christmas Eve and all its declaratory joy, and the quiet acceptance of Christmas Day where we bask in the glow of the One who comes, when we remember God with us, all that and more. And while I had a good Christmas, it's not over yet. We aren't through with it. The waiting and the longing, but also the proclaiming and the glorifying. We're still in the midst. We're still on the way. We're still far from where Christmas calls us to be. Or to quote you too, we still haven't found what we're looking for. And each year we repeat the process, the build-up, the anticipation, the joy, the disappointment when it's over. Every year, the same. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. You know the story. It's the only childhood story we have in the four Gospels. Some 30 years of life is reduced to a couple of baby stories that are just different enough to drive us crazy, and there's one story of an incident when he was 12. That's it. That's the whole life story of Jesus growing up. It's not terribly satisfying for someone who likes to overthink things sometimes. See, we want to know more. I mean, what kind of a kid was he? How did he wield such amazing power when he was barely able to reason? Or did he have such powers? Now, some scholars have argued over the years that the purpose of this story is to combat the adoptionist 
theories of Christology. Some began to suggest that maybe Jesus was just an ordinary person until he was baptized by John in the Jordan River. All those stories of the dove descending, the spirit resting, it's argued, is when God adopted Jesus and then he became the Son of God. That until that moment, he was just like you and me. He was an ordinary human being. Well, not so fast, says Luke. And then he tells this story to show that he was always the Son of God by birth. And more than that, he knew it. Now, just like us at Christmas celebrations, Jesus' family made the trip to Jerusalem for Passover every year. Now, some argue that this was the equivalent of Jesus' bar mitzvah. It was a special trip, but Luke says they went every year that this was just another year of going to Jerusalem for the Passover. It was a sign of the truly devout. It was a part of the law that all Jews who lived outside of Jerusalem would come back during Passover. And Joseph was a good Jew. And Joseph raised his family to be good Jews. So they would go every year. Now, a side note, That's why it was so crowded in the Passion story at the other end of the Gospel writings because so many Jews would go for Passover. Now, not every Jew did go, but almost everyone tried to do it at least once in their lives. But Luke says Mary and Joseph did it every year. It's pretty amazing, really, but in one sense it means that this trip was not that special. It was something that happened annually. Now, special, of course, it was special. Like Christmas Eve worship is special. Special, but it happens every year. Special, but not unusual. They had made the trip many times, and that explains the somewhat lax security protocols for this journey. You see, they traveled in a group for safety and for fellowship and for shared responsibilities. And usually in large public groups for... uh, like this one, the family grouping was secondary to the community of faith. The men usually led the way some distance in front of the women and the children lagging behind them. So on this trip, Jesus was 12, Luke tells us. Not quite an adult, but not feeling like a child. Maybe on the way to Jerusalem, he rotated who he traveled with, so that on the way home from Jerusalem, Joseph in the front assumed that he was with Mary, who was traveling in the back of the group, and Mary was assuming that he was up front with Joseph. Could happen. But it wasn't until they stopped after the first day's traveling and found each other and counted heads that they discovered they were both wrong. Imagine you, you stop for the night, and you gather all your kids around, and you're doing a head count, and you're missing one. And then you start going to all of your relatives to see if he might be with them, and he's nowhere to be found. He was nowhere to be found. Now, I like to think that Rhonda and I are good parents. We raised our kids, and we never lost a child before. We've never left one behind at the store and gone home. I mean, even taking large groups of kids on trips... We never lost a child. See, what we would do is we would assign numbers to each kids before we left our hometown, and we would count off before leaving anywhere we stopped and go through to make sure every child was still there. When you're dealing with somebody else's child, it's even worse when they get lost. So we would do this count-off system to make sure we had everybody. Now, we've, ha- we've had kids that were in the bathroom when we're supposed to be leaving, and we start this count off, and we're missing a number. And everybody's looking around like, where are they? What's going on? And then they come wandering over to the group. Oh, I'm here. And then we do the count off again. But we've never lost a child. So while I can't imagine the kick in the stomach feeling they got when they joined up that night, I have a sense of the panic that's about to set in. Now, Luke says... They went to search. But did they go immediately, traveling through the night, or did they wait till the next morning to travel when the sun up, when it was safer? And he says they searched for three days. So 
was that three days from when they left Jerusalem, including the day le- that they left and weren't really searching because they didn't know he was missing? Or was it three days after that, three days after they got back to Jerusalem, a day out and a day back, and then three more days? Now, I know that the three days gone was a sign of something else, but it does make you wonder, was he gone for five days? I mean, no wonder Mary was a bit miffed when they finally stumbled on him in the temple. You caught that, right? Look at what you've done. Why did you treat us like this? It's like he was doing this to spite them, just to wound them. Why have you treated us like this? Now, this kind of reminds me of the story of Samuel. Oh, his mom hasn't lost him in the temple. She knew exactly where he was. She even dressed him for the part. She made him a little robe, a preacher robe for a little kid hanging out in the temple. And she took him a new robe every year and left him there. She was so excited to leave him there, to give him over, this child she prayed for and wanted so badly, but she wanted him to remove her shame. Now, once Samuel was born, she gave him over to God's service. She didn't lose him. She lost herself. Now, Mary, why did you, not Mary, why did you treat us this way? Well, maybe she was lost too, and it seems that Luke, like Jesus, Jesus may have thought that same thing. And Jesus' response to his mother is amazing and layered, I think. At least I think Luke thought it was layered. Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And it's the second question that has caused the most conversation in biblical scholarship circles, partly because it doesn't really say, I'm in my father's house. Some translations have about my father's business. But the Greek is a little vague because neither house nor business is in the original Greek writing. It could literally be translated as, I must be in the, the of my father. The? Well, tois in Greek means the. But it could be things, the things. I must be about the things of my father. Kind of like we use the word stuff. I must be about the stuff of my father. Now, I know it's a little confusing, and it's no wonder all of the effort is on that sentence. Actually, I think any of them work. In my father's house, in a sense, of where God abides, which was more than the temple. About my father's business might not mean he's already begun his ministry at 12 and not 30 like the other Gospels claim. But instead, it might mean that Jesus was always focused on God's will above everything else. Either way, the boy Jesus makes a claim for being centered on God. But for me, it's the first sentence that's the important one. Why were you searching for me? See, that question is for all of us, not just Mary. Why are we searching? What do we want from Jesus? Do we want Him to come and be where we are? Do we want Him to come and do what we need done? Do we want Him to not give us reason to be anxious? Or do we search for Him so that we can be where He is? So that we can join Him in His Father's house? So that we can be about His Father's business? Or do we search for Him so that we can be in the Father's things? Why do we search for Him? And then, whose things are we most concerned about this Christmas season? The many things around us and of us? Or God's things? Why are you searching? I guess the real question is, who's lost? Is it Him or is it us? And how will you know when you find it? or are found. Should we be searching for Jesus? Or is He already searching for us? And we just have to look and realize it. 
Let's pray. At the right time, Lord, you sent your Son into the world. And many sought after the Messiah then, and we continue to do so today. As we search, help us to realize more diligent than our search, God searches us out to bless us through the abundance of God's grace. Let us realize, Lord, that you are here. All we have to do is accept you. We don't need to find you because you're here. But you're searching for us. Let us be found. Amen. Friends, we need not be discouraged about Christmas being over because we have the joy of knowing that because of Christmas, we have our Savior. And we should be telling that from every mountaintop that we can find. So go, tell the story of how God sent His Son so that we might be found and saved through Him. Go and tell the story. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.